Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to, to welcome our, our full panel here today for the checking in on standards training facilities and qualification this morning. Uh, on the panel today, I'd like to introduce uh, Adam Lewis, who is the head of training and operations at IMAC. Uh, Manish Varma, head of qualifications at the Nautical Institute. Rare Admiral, Admiral Bill Trulov, who is the Managing Director of CS Smart Academy. And last, Manish Singh, the CEO of Ocean Technology Group. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining me today on this panel. To get us started, may I suggest that we, we just uh, spend a few minutes introducing each of us. And if I, if I may start with you, Manish Singh, if you could uh, kindly go first to, with a short introduction. Thank you, Tommy, and good day to everyone, and a warm welcome especially to all the seafarers who have joined us online as delegates today. My name is Manish Singh. I'm the CEO of Ocean Technologies Group. We are the leading provider of learning solutions and operational software for the maritime industries. Today, two out of every three seafarers in the world and one out of every three seagoing ships use uh, Ocean Technologies Group uh, in some shape or form, and we are well underway to serving every seafarer globally um, in the coming years. I look forward to sharing our experience and to learning from the panel and from the delegates. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much, Manish. Thank, thanks for, for joining again. And if I if I may do the same uh, and ask you, uh, Bill, to, to shortly introduce yourself also. Certainly, and good morning to all the viewers and to our U.S. colleagues. Uh, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, my name is Bill Trulove. As uh, Tommy mentioned, I'm the managing director of CSMART, which is Carnival's uh, Maritime Simulation Training Center uh, located in the Netherlands, uh, just coming up uh, almost to the day, uh, three years. A uh, great privilege to be part of that team. Uh, Canadian by birth, uh, prior to this uh, uh, position, I spent uh, about 38 years in the Canadian Navy uh, as a deck officer up through command positions and a range of assignments after that. And really, really honored and privileged to be among uh, colleagues today for this important conversation. Thanks, Tommy. Thank you so much, Bill. And and moving on to Manish Barma, if you could do a short introduction also. Uh, thank you, Tommy. And uh, uh, I welcome all the participants uh, for this panel discussion. Uh, I'm head of qualifications uh, in the Nautical Institute. The Nautical Institute is NGO member of IMO. And we are more popularly known for maintaining standards for training and certifications for the DP or dynamic position vessels, uh, where we cover about 96% of the world's vessels and seafarers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manish Varma. And then finally, but absolutely not least, Adam Lewis, maybe you could introduce yourself also. Yeah, thanks, Tommy, and good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Um, my name is Adam Lewis, and I'm the Head of Training and Operations at the International Maritime Employers Council, or IMEC. Um, and at the moment, I'm mainly responsible for training roughly about 1,000 cadets for our 250-plus members. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. And moving ourselves straight in to the topics, we have three key questions to discuss today. What are training centers and universities focus on? and what needs to change, what are the vulnerabilities we need to address at an industry level, and priorities related to assessment and qualification. When I look at these questions, well, look, I, I want to turn to you straight away, many Singh, and say, well, uh, turning challenges situation into an opportunity, I'm keen to hear what you, as the CEO of the world's leading online training and competence assessment provider, has to say about this and your look into the future. Thank you, Tommy. You you talked about um, three aspects, three challenges. Um, uh, uh, let me talk about three main influences that I see uh, that will shape uh, learning and enablement in our industries. And the three C's uh, for us to focus on from, from my perspective are uh, COVID, carbon, and connectivity. Uh, I mean, obviously, we, we work with many dimensions, but these, these three are going to uh, quite um, uh, demonstrably shape the way that um, we work in the post-COVID environment and then the way that we interact between sea and shore. And this is not only the change in training, but change in operational workflow. And because of that, we have to train, we have to learn, we have to retool the, the kind of assembly line, so to speak, 
to, to work in the post-COVID environment. Um, and then, uh, especially through the last couple of years of COVID crisis, we have propelled forward, I feel, um, a few years in the way that uh, greater connectivity and more affordable connectivity is coming to ships. And that is unlocking new ways of integrating activity uh, as well as information on the ships. And the same is happening ashore as well. So uh, again, the way that the ship and shore uh, interface uh, works, uh, supported by more connectivity, uh, possibly also introducing new risks that uh, the industry has to learn to, to manage. And then the last, uh, and I suppose one of the most significant shifts will be delivering on the commitments that we have made as an industry in respect of decarbonization, because this is changing not only the future maritime fuel mix, uh, and, and because of that, the propulsion mix, but it's also fundamentally going to change the, the equipment, the technology, the risks, the operations that uh, colleagues at sea and those supporting them ashore are going to face. So I think these are the three very, very big, um, big influences. Um, but in spirit, I feel um, in recent decades, and as a seafarer myself, uh, I kind of saw this for experiences firsthand, is the focus of the industry has been imparting information on seafarers, information in case. Uh, I know that that will not work in the coming decades because there is so substantial change in such short time that we have to work with information in need rather than information in case. And this is the fundamental uh, challenge. And the way that we are um, responding to this challenge and you know, seafarers and ship managers on the, on the, on, in the delegates will know we talk about you know, adaptive learning, we talk about multi-locational learning, we talk about learning all at the same time, collective, synchronous learning, and we talk about asynchronous learning where you know you have an experience and then seafarers, shore-based colleagues are able to dip in and out. Um, I think it doesn't matter how we shape all of this, we've got to make the overall learning experience a lot more immersive uh, because that's what we see in life, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in society, in our day-to-day -day lives otherwise. Uh, new equipment will bring new scenarios which will require new skills, which will require new learning and support um, uh, requirements. STCW is well established as the global minimum standards for training, certification and watchkeeping. But the industry has to rewrite the book because it took us decades to equip for the technologies and the fuels and risks that we manage today. We've got a few years to uh, retool and rewrite the book for the, um, the decarbonized shipping industry that we are all committed to delivering. Uh, and in order to do that, um, uh, administrations will need to collaborate. We are working with quite a few of them. Um, we would need to find ways, better ways of recording, reporting, updating, developing proficiencies, sea time record and other information. Uh, and seafarers will not only call, carry their, their national biometric passport, they will carry their proficiency passport, which will fit uh, them from the situations that they are going to manage with the skills and the proficiencies that they have developed in their career so far. Um, you talked about blended learning, uh, Tommy. Uh, I think blended learning uh, obviously has been around for many years. Um, so that's not new. Uh, what is new is the blend ratio pre-COVID. Uh, we had ship managers who were expending about 10% of their effort online and 90% uh, of the effort was going in person. Um, and uh, I know in some discussions I've had with Manish Sharma, who's also on the panel, um, with the work that Nautical Institute has done in terms of polling seafarers in terms of how they wish to be engaged uh, in learning development assessment activities. And the vast majority have come back and saying it is not sustainable to keep doing um, and keep committing their time to such a high proportion of in-person learning and more and more would like the freedom, the flexibility and the enablement of online learning. So we are seeing in some cases the, the ratios shift exactly the other way around. And um, we have been blessed to play a, a part of that uh, by introducing aspects like virtual classroom, by working with leading OEMs like WordSailor, to introduce cloud simulation so that you can have the same simulation experience from your living room, from your office, from the ship, 
as you would in the full mission simulator um, scenario assured. So, um, so that convergence of those three Cs uh, will shape. Uh, and then the answer is not uh, in person or online. It is in person and online and then using the technologies that we've got. So there's not a lot of rocket science to be developed. It's just a, converse, it's just a, converse, a convergence of technologies today and then the adoption in a more uniform manner by the industry. So Tommy, I'm sorry, I'm peppering quite quite a few uh, thoughts there, but I'm sure we will as the panel uh, develops further, develop on them um, uh, in more detail. Excellent, uh, Manish Singh. Uh, really, really uh, good points. And uh, I like your three Cs to, to, to hang the, the subjects on to and, and, and follow on. Uh, really, really, really good. Let, let me move on to, to you, Bill, and, and being at the sharp end in the cruise industry, and which is, has faced tremendous changes uh, and in a corona period causing vessels to stop trading and, and all the crew uh, going on and off in, in very short time must have been a tremendous chance. How, how are you managing this and how, what's your view into the future and also looking at, at, at training and so forth, please? Thanks, Tommy. Really appreciate it. And, and first and foremost, thanks for your great presentation. I think you uh, nailed it and hit a lot of really important points. Uh, I, I just want to start, and I'm sure it's been said many times uh, during the week, but we can't say it enough. And that is a huge, huge thank you to all the seafarers out there and their families who have been traveling this very difficult journey over the last couple of years. Um, and at the same time, to all the shoreside uh, teams who have been going above and beyond to, to help all of the maritime industry um, to travel these uncharted waters. And, uh, you know, we're far from out of this yet, uh, but we're learning a lot on the go. And uh, as, as you uh, have mentioned, certainly, uh, you know, the cruise industry as a whole has, has had um, its share of challenges through it. But I think uh, on the positive, uh, have learned an awful, an awful lot. And, uh, and of course, uh, overarching all of this is that uh, businesses across all sectors have had to make some very difficult decisions uh, in terms of downsizing and, and responding to the real economics uh, related to all of this. And, and certainly as it relates to CSMART, we, we've had to travel that journey that not only did we have to uh, take a pause in uh, our on-site training, but um, sadly we had to let go of some really, really talented uh, individuals from our team. So. Um, as we look to the future, I, I'm incredibly optimistic, uh, realistic at the same time in that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we, we still got a bit of uh, uh, miles ahead of us in the, in the COVID journey. But I, I think uh, across the industry, we've seen a few trends. I, I think we've seen that we can do things different and still be very effective and still ensure the safety and compliance elements that are so important while also looking after the seafarers and enabling their success. And so, uh, as we've already heard, um, you know, online learning is not new, um, onboard mentoring and coaching not new, but I think we've, we've seen that we can bring greater coherence and coordination to the entire learning journey uh, from cadet to captain through the various developmental periods and give people the skill sets and the tools they need where they are. Uh, and certainly what we're hearing from uh, um, our seafarers is they really, really enjoy um, the online learning opportunities. They really like that it's being reinforced with onboard opportunities, um, but they're really anxious also to get back in and get hands on the simulators and freshen their technical skills uh, as well. And so I think that's all incredible. I, I think also uh, to pick up on a great point Manish made is that um, the sustainability agenda is so important. Uh, COP26, MEPC, the sustainability goals, and, and the timeline on that is only accelerating. So how do training establishments, as I say, get further upstream in the R&D planning cycle so that we can understand and anticipate and prepare for those new technologies that are coming? Because every new technology requires uh, a degree of training to enable the seafarer to implement it. Uh, in the most appropriate way. So I think that's an area probably worth uh, a bit more uh, discussion. Um, and I think another element certainly we've been focused on is uh, building those competency frameworks to give transparency and clarity to all seafarers of what is the journey, what are the steps that are required um, to advance uh, regardless of where you are in the organization. And of course that 
uh, only reinforces some of the uh, equity uh, points, Tommy, that you made in your presentation. So all to say, I, I just see tremendous opportunity. I think the challenge now is, as we look ahead over the next couple of years, we will get on the backside of this pandemic. Um, but what do we want to look like then? How are we actually taking a pause to reflect on what we've learned over the last couple of years? And how are we forward planning as an industry to capture those best practices, normalize the good things that we've learned and inculcate that into our cultures as we look to attract and retrain the best of the best to keep the industry moving forward. Uh, we all know that at the same time the pandemic hit, we were already anticipating a demographic bubble of retirement. Now the two things have come together. So how are we gonna manage that forward to make sure that this critical industry um, continues to uh, head in the forward direction? And with that, Tommy, I'll pause. Thanks so much. Excellent, uh, excellent, Bill, and 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 to just say, I I want to salute also the seafarers. Uh, we 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 sometimes take it a little too too granted, but uh, they have done an, a, a massive investment over the last two years, and and we can't thank them enough. So very good that you raised that up. I looking a, a little on, and listening to you on the competencies framework and and building training into into the higher levels of the R R and D streams. Uh, I'd like to, to to turn to you, Manish Farmer. Um, you're you're sitting at the, at the Nautical Institute as a, as a key member there. How do you look at it? What what's your response here? Uh, uh, thank you, Tommy. <clears throat> First, I'll add uh, in in addition to the seafarer, I'll also like to thank the families who have to go through uh, a lot uh, during the last two years. Uh, well. Uh, when the, the nautical institute uh, uh, has uh, ident uh, is in forefront in identifying the future skill gaps and training needs, mm -hmm. and we develop new and we have developed new qualifications. Uh, the new qualifications of uh, uh, we are uh, we are engaged with the uh, stakeholders and uh, uh, the couple of qualifications I can say it is like ballast control operator. Ice navigation. Uh, these uh, uh, qualifications have been developed and accepted by the industry. Uh, I think uh, we need to be one step ahead, as uh, earlier said, uh, that uh, we, the training institutes and the designers, train and training designers, have to be in touch with the R and D of the of the products. Uh, the, uh, that is that new products that are coming due to. Uh, you know, uh, 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 what you call decarbonization or uh, online learning because of, uh, you know, uh, restriction to travels and quarantine. Uh, I'll go a step ahead uh, uh, in this is the challenge. Uh, three C's have been said by Manish, uh, you know, which I agree. But there is also a need to train the retrain the trainers to give online delivery, having delivered quite a few online courses especially in the hybrid mode. Uh, there is a big challenge for the trainers to first to, uh, to know the underpinning knowledge of the students. Unlike in a physical classroom where we all had 15 minutes coffee earlier and we came to know the, 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 the trainees, how they are, this opportunity lacks in a hybrid classroom. And uh, so that's one challenge. The differentiation basis on that is also becoming a big challenge for the for the instructor. There's no time to assess the the base level of uh, uh, you know competency. Uh, in addition, uh, the uh, another challenge is the environment of the trainer um, of the training. Uh, we, we we have given a lot uh, quite a few as uh, uh, online training, uh, uh, and what we find uh, that there's a distraction first, uh, which obviously affects the retention. Secondly, not only in, in, in students or seafarers in the class, even the superintendent in the feedback have said to us, doing an online training from the in their from their offices or from the in the classrooms is very distracting because they have to do the office work also. So something that we need to be careful when we are designing training or we are you know we are getting our office staff to do training. Uh, that, uh, 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 you know, please give them time to get trained. Uh, 
<clears throat> the in addition i think uh, uh, the assessment part when it comes to is equally challenging uh, uh, we have to uh, design assessments that uh, are inclusive uh, with that i can say uh, you know uh, uh, the main challenge in summary will be to identify with the industry the future technology and basis this technology what skill gaps we are going to have and have the training in hand prior to it being in introduced uh, to uh, in practically on the ships mm -hmm. thank you Thank you so much, uh, Manish Varma. Uh, very, very good point. And I, I think the retraining and the, the retooling of instructors is critical. It is, it is critical that, that we make sure that the competence, the deep knowledge that our in, in instructors have, that that is uh, made available also. Tur turning now to you, Adam, uh, and representing IMAC and thereby a world of ship owners and managers, and considering your role looking at training and competence at a strategic level, you must be at the uh, epic center of what is happening. I'm, I'm excited to hear your perspective. Yeah, thanks, Tommy. Um, perhaps if, if I can really concentrate on the whole uh, recruitment and retention issue, which you spoke about, and that that's particularly one aspect I'm, I'm involved in because I need to get young people in the industry, but mm. of course, make sure they stay there as well. Um, and of course, COVID has brought a lot of changes to our industry, but I think it's important to step back and realize actually it wasn't COVID per se, COVID may have brought it forward a couple of years, but actually what's really changing the industry is the young people, even more than the technology. Um, you know, I, I get quite frustrated when I sit in, in industry meetings and um, people talk about the Generation Z coming through now. And uh, they said, you know, these are uh, people who expect handouts, they're not willing to work, um, you know, to, for success. I actually totally disagree. I think the young people coming up now have very different moles, have very different standards, and our leadership needs to adapt to make sure that our industry stays attractive for these young people. Um, and I think, you know, two years ago, millions of young people uh, around the world um, went out of school and protested about um, environmental changes, about uh, um, pollution. And I think that has to be a shot across our bow of how these young people want to be led and the industry these young people want. So when we talk about remote working, um, you know, and, and hybrid training, this is all very great. You know, it's, it's all new initiatives, but in, in five years time, it is going to be what these young people expect. They're not going to expect to go in classes every day. They're going to adapt better uh, doing this. Um, you know, even if we look at the main labor supply countries in the world, when I go out to the Philippines 10 years ago, everybody wanted to be a seafarer. Now, everybody wants to be in Starbucks with their Apple laptop and, and their cappuccino. And that, that's just, I, I think, a good example of, of where things are changing. Uh, changing sorry. Um, and of course, these young people bring a, a lot of new skills. Um, you touched upon things like cybersecurity. Um, and, and these young people are going to be a lot more digital natives. So they're going to come to the industry with those skills rather than just having to train them, which is something we're going to have to do at the moment. Um, and I just want to touch on, on one thing that uh, Manish just said from, from the Nautical Institute, and that's about uh, training of the trainers for this new environment, because this is something at IMEC we have been involved in. Um, we, we decided uh, a couple of years ago to start a new um, train the trainer course for existing lecturers and to give them a bit more, uh, some skills to take into the classroom. Now, we all had this set up. Um, we had some trainers from Sodent University who were due to go out to the Philippines. We had all their flights booked. And the next thing is is COVID kicked in. So we sort of shook hands and said, well, let, let's talk again when the pandemic dies down. Um, what we realized about three or four months into the pandemic is that you know training hadn't stopped, had gone online. Uh, and this required a whole new, new range of skills um, because you, you may have a lot of charisma in the classroom, but creating an online environment is a totally different kettle of fish. So we actually went back to, to Solent and said, well, can you design a course around this? Um, and th this is what we created. We, we ran a pilot course uh, at the end of last year. We're running full courses now. There's another course next week. Uh, and one of the aspects of it, or big aspect of it, is how to create this uh, online environment. Um, and this is something that we found trainers can adapt to very quickly um, and they can apply a bit of creativity to it um, and, and really create something online that young people aren't being hampered by, but actually 
um, you know, are enjoying and, and being able to uh, develop their knowledge. So, uh, yeah, so thank you very much. That's my initial thoughts, and, and I look forward to this discussion. Th thank you very much, Adam, and, 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 and thanks for bringing up the, the recruitment and retention, and especially the young generations coming in. Um, I'd like to come back to that in a moment and just just also echo you on, on Train the Trainer and, and the initiatives you're doing there. Uh, at OSM, we are supporting that program also and are putting our trainers to it. And, and the feedback we are getting is very positive. So it's a really excellent and, and full support and I can only recommend others to follow. Um, if I could build a little bit on your on your talk, Adam, on, on, on the young people coming in and the expectations of a much more individualized approach also uh, treating everyone a little bit more unique whereas in in training historically in shipping we've trained everybody to the same standards everybody has gone through the same courses everybody is is basically going through the tra same uh, learnings and, and just asking you adam straight here uh, uh, what are you seeing in this are, are, are we to continue just letting everybody go through the same training or is there a shift towards maybe individualizing it based on their actual competencies and, and knowledge? Jim, this is, this is a very good question. I think if I, if I knew it, my job would be very different today. <laughs> um, but, but perhaps if I can comment a bit on that, um, one of the things we were quite lucky in a way because we, we operate in a college in the Philippines um, and due to its military connection, uh, it didn't have to close down, but all the mm -hmm. uh, courses did go online. Um, and it just happens before the pandemic, uh, a, a totally unrelated is that the college came out with a new learning management system. Uh, and um, because of that, we gave each each cadet an iPad and they were able to go and do their courses. Um, of course, this brings huge advantage because normally if you give a traditional class, uh, like you say, you sit in front of a classroom, you deliver a standard course, and then you give an examination at the end and that's, uh, you know, whatever questions are on there are pretty much what everyone has. You, you get a pass or fail. Um, I think the advantage of going online in a more digital uh, environment um, is that uh, individuals, and it could be young people, can be um, seasoned seafarers, uh, can take a bit more ownership of their training. So, you know, a lot of these... Uh, examinations they might have a question bank of 6,000 questions or, or plus so seafarers can now undertake an examination they can analyze themselves uh, where their weaknesses might be they can do some you know additional training in those areas um, and really work on their their key competence themselves rather than just being told what to do and from, from what we've seen so far um, I think people like that approach they like being able to take more ownership of it rather than just being told you know this is how to do things um so you know i, I think some of the things that ocean technologies group are doing in this area is is fantastic because this is really going to allow us to get much more competent seafarers thanks thanks a lot for for that adam and, and if i may uh, lift it straight into so manage what Adam is saying, many uh, saying. Adam Lewis is saying here, Ocean Technologies Group are, are actually doing something here. What what are what are you actually doing in in skilling the individual and the role more than just the the group, so to speak? Uh, thanks, Tommy. Thanks, Adam. Uh, may, maybe to 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 avoid repeating the the kind of tired rhetoric around um, competence management systems and adaptive learning. And, uh, you know, th these are all very well understood and they are well, well in train and we are, we are building on these. I go back to the point I made earlier information in case our entire industry is told to shove information in case onto the, onto the seafarers. And, and that's where we are, uh, we are anticipating won't work in the future. So let me give you an example. I am, let's say, a very experienced chief engineer, 15 years experience in rank. I am now taking a ship over for you, uh, Tommy, uh, in South Korea, uh, coming straight out of the yard. Uh, who is the trainer here? Because let us say the ship, you know, we're talking about new fuel mixes. Let's just, say, you know, for argument's sake, let's say, imagine the ship is an ammonia fueled vessel. Who is training? How are we equipping that chief engineer, you know, um, that chief engineer's team, that kind of wider uh, shipboard team, the wider fleet management team uh, in terms of the skills that they need? And who is the trainer? 
is it just your in-house company trainer is it um, the superintendent is a fleet manager i think the trainer of the future itself is changing because information in need will have to be pumped so um you know um uh, we, we talked earlier about the work that we are doing with wordsilla for example wordsilla is the leading uh, oem in the sector and i see uh, have been recognized for being number one in terms of their technology leadership so they are producing equipment that will be introduced into the field and the industry needs to pivot very quickly to be able to safely and efficiently operate that equipment so what we are doing is creating the umbilical between the administrations the oems the ship managers the training centers are sure and to the seafarer at the point of operation so right there next to the equipment in the engine room right there in front of the egg disc uh, on the bridge and uh, how do they pull knowledge how do they pull operating procedure how do they simulate right there so this is not about doing once before you go on the ship one full brm um, simulation course that's so last century what we are talking about is you are now making port you are about to go into that scenario and you want to simulate right now what you are going to about uh, what you are about to enter into and that you can do you know so if i invoke the the two C's uh, out of the three I talked about post COVID, we don't want to send uh, people, we can only limit uh, sending uh, people into short based training centers. Uh, but that doesn't, um, that doesn't limit possibilities, we can do that online, we can do that even on board, subject to connectivity um, catching up. And then we are imparting information in time in need. And ultimately, it's about decision making, it's about allowing the individual to make better decision making, and to perform uh, and, and as a result of that stay safe and, and operate efficiently so so we are bringing aspects like uh like adaptive learning yes we are building aspects like uh, virtual online enablement so virtual classrooms uh, we have taken pretty much the entire portfolio of what can be done in a full mission brick and mortar simulation environment into a full click and mortar digital environment through the cloud and um, if i may uh, just to build on what uh, Manish Verma said, uh, fully agree. And this is why, uh, uh, you know, we believe that the answer is not or, it is and. So you can create a lot more opportunity for those kind of trainings, but it is no replacement for having a sufficient amount of human time, human contact. And like we have pivoted, you know, in our own day-to-day -day activities, I think the CPR is pivoting as well in the way that they use the technologies. So happy to take any specific questions, but um, this is a kind of largely framing what uh, how we are uh, seeing changes and how we are responding to Excellent, man. Thank, thank you so much. And, and, and building upon what you, Bill, said earlier, bringing training further up the R&D chain and the initiatives that Manish Singh and Ocean Technology Group is doing with Vasila builds around the same. Bill, sitting at, at the training center, what, how are you looking at, at skills for the role versus skills for the environment? And, but also uh, the, the trainer's role in the future, how, how are you looking at this? Thanks, Jan, and, and I really appreciate the last bit, uh, the trainers, because we're, we're talking a lot about the training audience, but uh, equally important is those that are delivering the training and uh, picking up on a comment that Adam made, and, and certainly we went down a parallel track of, uh, we, we recognized early that we, we need to enable our trainers um, to operate in a completely different environment effectively. So uh, there again, we, we built in house and implemented a, a train the trainer program um, but at the same time, I think uh, on the thematic of bringing a more individualized approach, um, how do you build curriculum that um, also has inherent in it an ability for the instructor to adapt to the training audience on the Monday morning, uh, on day one of training, um, where as we move forward to um, the next bound, you may have a, a group of participants on a program ranging from new hires through to very experienced folks, and it may be proportionately different every week. So how can you have a training framework that allows the instructor to adapt that program as required to meet the needs of the audience of the day? So um, maybe predominant new hires, you may have to adjust the training program and have flexibility both in delivery and, and how you, you confirm things on the back end. So that's something that we've been thinking a lot of. Um, you're right, looking at uh, the individual competencies uh, mapped against where they are in their journey and uh, having that two-way conversation with the individual of where do they think they need a little extra help 
and, and how can we tailor our training to actually get at their individual needs. I think this all speaks to a point that Adam has made, and that is as we move forward, we've come an awful long way over the last several decades of normalizing training in the maritime industry and accepting that training is really important and it has to happen uh, in various venues from on board, online, on site to help individuals move through their, their career path. And certainly what I see is uh, when we bring um, new hires into the center, um, at the end of the week, it's not, uh, you know, I can't wait to get on the plane and get home. Clearly, they want to get back to their loved ones. It's, you know, I love this. Give me more. This is so important. And I feel so much more confident leaving the center having had this experience. And, oh, by the way, we want more of this, this, and this, because that's going to help us get better. And what you see is challenging in terms of manipulating the technology. Uh, for us as a younger generation, this is all normal. And, oh, by the way, catch up to where we are because here's where we want to go. And so there's the pressure that I think will drive us forward on some of this stuff. Back to you, Tony. Uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant answer, Bill. And, and thank you, I'm full support. For, if I could move maybe to, to you, Manish Varma, and, and, and also the third point of our, our agenda is uh, the, the, the whole assessment and, and certification and qualification. I, I also see that uh, Vinayak Mola has raised a question around the revision of STCW. With this individualization of, of training and competence, also linking it with the rapid developments and changes in technology, um, what do you look? How do you look at at the whole uh, at the whole revisions of, of of STCW, but also the qualifications and, and certification? Um, I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, by nature, any statutory code or regulation takes time. And uh, in the in, a, in this uh, our industry is changing very fast with uh, the technology, the the demand, the demand. So uh, the best, in my view, a solution forward is that the industry decides to do the self-regulation, make the standards and uh, training programs and monitor them. The Nautical Institute is, um, as I said, again in the forefront. We uh, identify the training needs before, uh, you know, uh, much before the flag states or statutory, uh, you know, authorities uh, uh, even come to think of it, and then bring uh, standards in con collaboration and consultancies with the stakeholders. And because we are more practical, we take the seafarers' view also directly from them. We our standards are more industry accepted by the industry. Uh, you know, as they are practical and caters to the operational need of the industry. So, um, what again, as I said, is something that we can't wait for STCW to come with with the training standards. It is the industry which has to sit and decide and develop the standards. I hope that answers uh, the question. Uh, very nice, Manish. Uh, thank you so much. And if, if, I, if I could to, go to you again, Adam, uh, a little bit on the same question, the ASTCW uh, 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 revision, but also at the same time, I see a question from, from Sanjay uh, Booknight asking into the, the competency management, uh, not just looking at officers, but also uh, ratings. Um, Adam, could I, could I get your perspective here? Yeah, thanks. And I can probably tie the two in actually. Um, first of all, in, in regards to uh, STCW, um, even though IMEX not actually, uh, we haven't got any status at the IMO, um, I'm involved in quite a few discussions uh, about the next revision. Um, there, there's obviously a lot of primarily talks talk going on at the moment uh, about what the next revision should contain. Um, really from here, we're looking at a minimum of seven years uh, before the next revision comes out. I, I would predict the next one would be out around about the late 2020s. Um, a lot of people who've got more experience than me feel it would be nearer to 2035. Um, and that, that that brings quite a big issue for us and maybe a, an opportunity instead. And, and that's that if we think each revision of STCW has got about 20 years um, lifespan in it, if it came out in 2035, then by the time we get to 2055, we're going to have some ships out there that are fully manned 24 hours a day. We're going to be some ships out there which are, are fully manned, but you know, in, in open waters in the middle of the Pacific, uh, they won't be holding bridge watches. 
So I think that the next vision of, of STCW won't be able to be as prescriptive as it is now. There's going to have to be a lot of flexibility in it. Um, and I, I think we'll probably go down the same route as um, perhaps the aviation industry, where you know you, you get your, your um, basic licenses, and then you go to British Airways, you go to Virgin, and you take um, uh, almost aeroplane-specific courses um, on, on certain Boeings and Airbuses. So I think that's the way we might go down. Um, in, in regards to the ratings, this is something we've had big discussions on within IMEC recently. And uh, and five years ago, I would say the traditional business model for ratings, um, or I, I don't want to call them business model, but the, the basic model was that uh, you had a pool of ratings and your very best competent uh, ratings you trained up to become officers. What a lot of our members are saying now is, well, with these new complex ships coming out, um, we can't follow that model anymore because we need really good standard uh, of senior ratings, you know, especially at the, the pump man level. Um, so what we've actually done recently, and, and again with the Ocean Technologies Group, is we've come out with a competency management system for ratings, which is uh, available to all, all IMEC members free of charge. And it's basically a way that companies can now monitor the um the competition ratings and and make sure they can go up into those uh, senior levels um and and the next stage is we're going to have to start looking at uh ratings giving mentoring um because you know we often focus on the mentoring the leadership from an officer perspective but there's a lot we still need to do at the ratings as well so um i, I think this is something that the industry is really starting to look at uh, thank you tommy Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, we, we're running into the final five minutes of, of the conversation. And to, to round it up, I, I'd like to ask each of each of our panel members to maybe spend one minute each of just uh, closing up with a final remark and, and also looking at some of the questions that we have received on, on the chat functions. If I could ask uh, Manish Barma to go first here. Manish, uh, and, yeah. and maybe you could, uh, you, could, uh, you could add a little bit to what Adam just said. That would be nice. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I agree with Adam, and, and but I think I, I would like to add, unlike the aviation industry, where the types of aircraft are, you can count them in in, in tens. Uh, this is not the case with the shipping industry. Uh, 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 in, uh, per se, as regards the the cargo to the to the type and size of ships, so uh, it's a it's a challenge. We can adapt it, but it's a challenge how to adapt. Um, I do see a question on 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 from Raal Harris uh, from Ocean Technology uh, about uh, getting uh, trade associations and bodies to start developing standards. I, I agree with him. Um, I think that's the way forward. Uh, Nautic Institute obviously uh, is one of uh, the many um, you know, professional organizations. And we are, we do collaborate, you know, we do collaborate with IMAC, other bodies, Intertanko, Intercargo, Inter and, uh, and uh, so the, I think a foundation exists. It's for us now to take it further, further forward and develop to in developing the standards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manish Varma. A final comment from you, Bill? Uh, absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, again, a great discussion and, and something I've heard consistently across a number of panels over the last years. You know, as an industry, we've taken a big step forward in collaborating and sharing best practices, and we need to sustain that. Uh, we've been kind of forced into that place, maybe overstating a little bit, but as we look to the backside of the pandemic and life beyond, uh, keeping the dialogue going, uh, I think the point on ratings can't be reinforced enough. Uh, clearly from the cruise industry, and as Adam alluded to, bigger, more complex ships, uh, we, we, we need to put a little more attention on how we are shaping, if you will, that middle management tier, those senior ratings, um, to lead effectively those that are uh, in their uh, in their teams. Um, we've learned a lot. We're building on tremendous progress over, as I say, decades here. Uh, and I see some really wonderful opportunities uh, as we look to the future. And we better get on with it because those that we are looking to attract and bring into the industry from across all uh, segments of society, and we need to bring people in from all segments of society, want to come into an industry that is innovative, future looking, and reflective of where society is going. And we have a tremendous opportunity. We just have to step up and own it. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks a lot, Bill. M Manny Singh, final comment from you? 
Um, very very quickly, a lot has been said. Um, number one, uh, as uh, Adam Lewis said, we collaborated on the uh, on the competence management um, systems development for ratings. I, I do have to say, I take exception to our industry still make the differentiation of officers and ratings. This is very 20th century. Uh, we have got to start building competence management systems for seafarers because the way that industry is changing, we are really looking at every individual operator, the, the way things will change, you know, you know, profiles like pumpman, fitter, you know, bosun, officer of the watch are going to blur uh, uh, when the, the three C's I was talking about. And if I could pump a fourth one would have been collaboration. So that will change. Uh, and also, I think in terms of the policy making, uh, we have the industry bodies. Yes, uh, there are perhaps too many voices uh, in industry voices uh, in, in industry bodies and they are not collaborating. So there's no single voice. And the voice of the seafarer is implicit in those industry bodies, but it's not explicit. We need to actively reach out to the seafarers via bodies like Nautical Institute, IMEC, and many, many others, Intermanager, Intertanko, and then get the seafarer to participate because a lot of us are two steps removed from the action and we need to retool the assembly line based on the individuals that we are so kind of unanimously celebrating, but at least give them the courtesy of share of voice and how we uh, rewrite the rule book. Thank you so much, Manising. We are almost out of time. Final, final comment from you, Adam, uh, to just finish off as the last one here. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll just uh, finish off by answering that question that's been posed to me about should trade associations like IMEC start developing standards? Um, I would say, no, it's not our responsibility. Uh, it's not the IMO's responsibility anymore either. It's it's everyone's responsibility. Um, we're all out there doing stuff. What we need to do is collaborate a lot more. Um, even at a company level, if you've developed a, a, a Pacific course, um, my challenge to you would be make that open source and, and IMEC will make that, uh, we'll, we'll try and meet that challenge as well. Um, and I think the more we do that, then the more we can um, address competences in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Adam. And thank you, Manny Singh, Manny Swam, Adam Lewis and Bill Trulov for, for, for joining me on the panel today. I really look forward to us doing this in, in person, hopefully next year in, in, in Manila, where we then can, can engage much more with the audience. We can hopefully discuss it also at, at, at more length because we could have continued for hours here. Thank you all very much. And thank you to, uh, to all the sponsors and, and, uh, and back to you, uh, Chris. Thank you so much uh, for this. Thank you. Wish thank you all you. Great. Thanks so much, Tommy, and, and thank you to the, to the whole panel. I won't reiterate that, but what a fantastic discussion. And yeah, definitely in Manila next year, let's try and give this a, a little bit more time and some, some more engagement. But thanks to all of you who watched and engaged. Greatly appreciated. Hope you got uh, some real value out of that. And uh, if you tuned in late and want to catch up uh, on what you missed, you can watch this on demand. So please uh, share that with, with your colleagues and peers. Uh, we've got just over another hour of content for you today, so please stick around and watch and don't forget to browse the platform make connections uh, uh, between you and also to check out the profiles of our of our sponsors who've uh, um, very generously helped us pull pull this together this year coming up next uh, Vartzilla voyage bring us a, a great session looking in uh, looking at the uh, the route to digital learning success so stick around don't go anywhere and we'll see you soon